Okay, well, hi, Bill. How are you doing? How are you doing, Porik? <laughs> we're still alive, more or less. Still alive, still alive. Yeah. We're, we're, you know, yeah. it's gas. You've, you've migrated to the West since our time working together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, um, as you can see behind me here, I, I have my studio here. It's absolutely this is beautiful. Where, this is where I, yeah, this is where I work now. It's, it's a kind of, um, as you know, because we we did so many times, um, we 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 in the in the days that we were recording with those nervous animals, we were always in somewhere where there was absolutely no light, other than the lights in the room, and uh, no windows or nothing that looked out on anything. And here I've got a good few windows that look out on Randstone Bay, um. and it's just it's a lovely environment to be in. You know, um, I don't. This is not a commercial studio, um, but. I've done so many projects here just that I'm either personally connected to. Um, for instance, we did a Colin McAnumera's last album here. Right. Which we recorded, actually, which we recorded analog. On, yeah. Have, yeah, in the next room I have an old, uh, my old Studer 24-track analog machine. Right. Wow. Yeah, it was beautiful. And, and, and what was lovely was that we set up in such a way that, you know, as you know, very often tracks now can begin life in one studio, move to another studio, be sent, as we've all had to do during Zoom times, uh, where we've had to send tracks off all over the world to have people playing on them. And now, but, but here, when we did Cullum's album, everybody just set up together. And we, uh, listen, there was nothing like it. It was just like, there is something that happens when musicians sit in a room mm -hmm. together and understand what each of each each of them are doing, and just find that they you know it's it's a very subtle thing, but they find that common area, that little area where the, where there is a kind of uh, some kind of a magic where the, where they connect. I don't want to make too much of it, but I definitely feel that there's something that goes on there. The playing together in a room mm -hmm. at the same time responding you know is very very much you know it's missing a lot now because we do so many things now uh which are remote and which you know mm -hmm. people put, put on their bit onto it and send it back over the internet um but you are missing that sort of alchemy of um just just when when you know, when you hear the drummer doing something, or you hear the bass player doing something, and that excites something in you, and and there suddenly is a there is a, a collegiality to the performance, a, a comradeship that we're we're heading in the same. We found we found the road, and we're on the same road. Do you know, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, e even from the point of view of going back to the, those nervous animals and the stuff we did with you, one of the things that's interesting is that the original, my friend John was live pretty much in the studio absolutely and i still remember the session i can still i still remember the session and it's funny there are two two things i mean i did i worked we did that in in lombard i'm not sure whether it was called westland or lombard when we recorded it was probably you know because it had a name change it was yeah. originally lombard and then it became westland studios but it was a 24 track facility, I think, yeah. at that time. And, um, and we went in, and I can still see us in the room together. And I can still see that, you know, when the chorus happened, you know, there's some kind of little riffs start to appear. And, you know, it was, <clears throat> you know, and, and there is a kind of creativity, isn't there? Mm. There's, a, there's a, a, a creativity that happens again when you're all together in a room like that. I suppose, you know, when t things became time critical, like, like uh, you know, if you're working for music for film and stuff, that's when we needed clicks and we needed, but now everything is done to click and everything is, you know, uh, whether it's needed for film or, or, or being um, mixed in with something else that's coming from another source. You can see the sense of it there. But, you know, again, just going back to Colin McAnumara's album and, what we did and, and my friend John, you know, we're here, we play the track and then we have to sort of say, was that a good take? You know, uh, no, we do one more. And somewhere along the line, 
you have to have a critical decision making capacity open up in yourself. Mm. You say, right, that was it. That was the take. And mistakes we're, that, are not, or you know, yeah, warts and all. That's the one we're living with. That's the one we're going to live with. And that was, uh, that had two things. First of all, you might say, oh, it's a pity, you know, and there have been times, many times when you say, well, look, I'd like to go back and fix that. But there's a big plus to it as well. It, it, it opens up this uh, focus in mm. a way. So I remember Colm said, <laughs> Colm said one thing at one stage. He said, you know, nowadays, he said, the producer presses the button on the desk and says, okay, that was terrible. Come on in. <laughs> 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 because we can fix that later. You know, we can, we can detune it. We can move it around. <laughs> That was terrible. Come on in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember, I remember some great yarns that you told me. One in particular was about your early beginnings with, um, you know, transcribing, uh, you know, parts on, on Orida and those early experiences you had getting in your, your, what informed your, 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 your arrangement skills and later on and things. Yeah. It's very interesting that that whole issue, and I, I, you know, I return to it again and again throughout my working life, and also in my interaction with education, with music education, which oh. you know has been considerable over the years. Both of my, you know, being on the on the board of uh, the University of Limerick and then Berklee School of Music in Boston, right. and um, you know, there were, there were, it's it's interesting that I came my musical experience my my education kind of my formal education stopped when i did the grades uh and and i i stopped going to music lessons as a as a young fellow and then i went out and with whatever skills i had picked up at that stage i then tried to you know i wanted to wanted to uh, use these skills to do what i felt i i could do forgetting that maybe Behind me, I was leaving quite a lot of information that would have been useful. <laughs> but in your enthusiasm to kind of go ahead, you just you just go ahead, and um, you're driven forward by that. But gradually, I began to realize that you know, for instance, I really wanted to orchestrate and to arrange and to do that, and I really didn't have the chops to do it. So where was I going to learn this? So as I began my early life as a, a session player, working with uh, as a contracted musician in places in RTE and stuff, I began to get work as a music copyist. So that, say, for instance, somebody like the legendary Noel Keelan, who had done an arrangement, I would get his score and I would copy out all the individual parts. So the, starting with the flutes, uh, the piccolos, flutes, oboes, bassoons, I'd copy them all out for and recording. The clef and all of that. Uh... Exactly. And then I began to, as a result of that, I began to understand what the whole technical aspect of arranging was about. And then gradually I began to be given some work because I really, I was driving. I wanted, this I wanted to do. So I was going there. It was just a question of how I was going to get there, was, you know, which bus I was going to get on. And, um, but I was certainly moving forward. And uh, so gradually um, I began to, uh, I began to get work and then I would do these little arrangements and, and you would make mistakes. I mean, one I remember particularly was when I did an arrangement of an old Irish tune for the RT Concert Orchestra. And uh, Noel Keelan was conducting the arrangement, even though I had done the arrangement this time and copied it myself. I brought the arrangement in and I remember this guy called Richie Burbridge playing the piano, God rest him. And, uh, um, and it was harp, piano, strings. And, you know, as the, as the piece built up, it was a slow air. As the piece built up, then there was been added in woodwinds and stuff. And, you know, and Noel was such an encouraging teacher. He didn't know he was a teacher, but he was a teacher. He didn't know it. But he was there, and he had a friend for his mouth, or he, he'd conduct like this. And suddenly, as everything was going along, he turned to me and he said, very nice, Dad, very nice. Now, you've no idea how important that was, just to hear those words. Mm -hmm. Very nice, Dad. I, I knew I had I'd moved on a little bit. Mm -hmm. No sooner said that than there was a massive explosion from the brass. <laughs> we all looked up and everyone in the brass section 
<laughs> they're, they're, they're totally they're red faced the guys are having <laughs> coronaries <laughs> <laughs> for about four bars <laughs> and Noel turned to me and he said I think we may have meant that down the octave down <laughs> Because you had to do transposition for the instruments, you know, and I had obviously written the brass up the octave. Oh. A mistake I never made again, by the way. But, <laughs> but that was, you know, just one of those little steps along the way that you gather by doing. And it's a very interesting thing. You can you can flood the brain with all kinds of information about what what a fugue was and how Bach worked with fugues and how, you know, and you can do all that, but this, you do need to have that practical experience mm -hmm. that you go out and do it and you expose yourself in a little way. You expose mm -hmm. yourself. There's like there's 50 people sitting there and they've got your music in front of them. And that's an exposing time. It's like, you know, and some of them couldn't care less and they want to go home or what time is lunch, you know. <laughs> And it's it's a very it's it's quite a humbling experience, mm -hmm. but when it works, uh, and when you start to understand what an orchestra does and what an arrangement is, I mean, people, and this going back to my friend John, you know, arrangement is so important. Like learning to orchestrate, basically, it's a technical exercise, and the really great ones will will use that technique to really great effect. Somebody like Ravel, mm -hmm. whose orchestrations, if you listen to something like. Uzorsky's um, piano pieces originally that Ravel then orchestrated. Mm. Pictures at an exhibition. Great exhibition, yes, wonderful. Yeah, oh, stunning, stunning arranging, or orchestrating. But arranging is the thing, arranging of where, and particularly in our milieu of popular mm. music, you know, whatever song, you know, you need those moments of a, a build, you add a little bit, you build it up, you pull it back, you do that, all that, and core, um, um, harmonic accompaniment to tunes, to songs, all of that that give it shape. And, and, and the arranger is the shaper. He shapes the piece of sculpture in a mm. way. That is such an important skill. And it doesn't require to know, you know, what, what clef you write the violas in. And you don't need to know that to be an arranger. To be an arranger, you need to know what the dynamics of music are. And I think in my friend John, there was an arranging <clears throat> you know, the way the verses and the choruses were treated and we built and we pulled back and mm. you know, and and then we had the up out the play out at the end. All of that was all part of arranging. And uh it's it's absolutely essential to the shaping of music, you know. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Like I was looking at something about the Beatles lately, and you think, how on earth did you get those lads in their twenties in nineteen sixty eight? Two or something Great that, that knew people. about these kind of how did they know about stuff like that? And in a way, something like that is the same where you know you just throw the you know, like you were saying about there's there's so much has happened that had gone on as, as we get older, we realize, oh my goodness, Ravel and you know, whatever it is, you know, an awful lot of really cool things have happened that flat and fives and you know, uh, you think of Bernstein and God knows where, where you want to start. But in a way, like, we, I started out of rock and roll. So uh, listening to just trick or tricks. And it's then just realizing that John Lennon was doing all these mad things like flatten nines. And you, you, you wonder, how did he find out about stuff like that? And it's, well, it's very interesting. Let me tell you an, uh, an experience I had, which is, you know, it's first-hand experience. I had dinner one night with George Martin. And uh, th this was like, you know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> one of those ones where you're yeah. in pinch mode. You know, yes. I having dinner with George Martin. But I'd become friendly with Jimmy Webb, the American songwriter, and he invited me to dinner with George Martin one night. And, of course, I arrived for dinner with my head full of questions. You know, God, I'd love to know, you know, who was <laughs> hard at the end of... Um, day in the life you know blah, blah, yeah blah. but you're you're also not gonna be in an embarrassment you know <laughs> and before the guys had his melon you, you have him with 20 questions about you know magical mystery tours <laughs> so uh but at some 
some stage I did say to him, because I said, whose idea was it to do the intro to um, All You Need Is Love in 7-4? Mm. And it's love, 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 down, love, love. It comes around earlier than you expected, so it's in seven. Um, and why is it, why did I said, I said, that must have been you, George, wasn't it? And he said, oh no, not at all. He said, you know, that, that was the way John played it originally. And, you know, they, they did have this extraordinary, I mean, uh, it's funny, I was just listening to a radio program about them the other day, and they, whatever was going on, and I think there's something profound about this that goes on occasionally in our, in, in our social ether, that occasionally some people are gifted with a particular insight that's kind of miles away from what you would expect, like there are three card merchants up to them, but here they were doing things like a day in the life and you know uh, even the uh, George Harrison song all of them seem to be affected by it. and one of the things George Martin said to me was that Ringo was really an important like in his view I mean it was all these kind of jokes about Ringo Ringo like oh. George Martin's re regard for Ringo was enormous you know and um, I mean there's no doubt about it that George Martin brought the technical expertise of doing something like Eleanor Rigby you know, or she's leaving home, you know, yeah. to do that. But, but the, the creative, the original creative spark for all of these things, I'm convinced now, came from the guys, and, you know, and they happened to be very lucky to link up with the, with the, uh, the producer who yeah. understood that they had that and was going to help them to bring that forward without taking it over himself. What an you incredible know. conjunction. Thing. Yeah, but that was it. It was and because I mean, up to then, we always had you know or at least after that, then we had the kind of the cult of the producer, you know, where you know the various names that appeared over the years as the producer who did that produce. Exactly. And indeed, they were great. It, it was it's a real gift. But when you think of what George Martin did in being the conduit to this creative urge in a way that was respectful of it. And yet, at the same time, improving of it. Oh. Unbelievable. Amazing. And I, when I think of uh, these little series of talks we're going to do, uh, one person we def definitely must try and get on board is Philip Bakley, who was very much yeah. a, a, a part of the team with yourself at that point when we were working together. Yeah, Philip, Philip uh, and I have, uh, you know, over the, I mean, you know, sometimes I used to wonder about you know, the, the whole thing that, that arose in the 80s of, you know, training people to become recording engineers. And, and you found pieces, you know, people training people, you know, schools that would turn out 40 engineers in a year or a term, you know, 40 young people coming out oh. in the world. But now I know how to, I know what EQ is and I know how to do this and do that. And the music industry is out there kind of going, okay, great, but we only need so many of them. And like in my lifetime, uh, Brian Masterson, Andrew Boland, uh, Philip Begley, Kevin Killen, you know, the, the, the number of engineers, Tim Martin, God, God rest him, you know, um, the, the, those, the, it's, a, it's a small group that my career, which stretches nearly up to 40 odd years now, um, like it's a small group of people at the end of the day um, and they're a very special kind of, they, again the marriage between a producer and an engineer I mean some engineers did go on to become producers and it became like God when I think of like how, how much time we spent getting a, a snare sound do you know I mean it really, I think, <laughs> now, and I think what the heck were we at at all? Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, no, 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 put a pillow in it. No, no, I tell you, no, no, get some tape and put it over. Now, put the microphone out in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody is saying, hold on, stop. What about the song? Where's the, where's the song going here in this, in this bass drum sound or snare sound? Where is the song? And that... I think that that became a factor of the sort of technology uplift in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and 
you know, and then onwards, obviously, to where it is now, which is even light years away. You, well, you when, when we were working first, we, it was digital, it was just coming in, and it was terribly cool. Like the fair light arrived, and um, we wanted things to be digital. We could. <laughs> <laughs> Fair light. I hate to, uh, like, we, Philip and I uh, did an album with a band called Minor Detail. And uh, part of their, you know, they were two very gifted songwriters, uh, John and Willie Hughes, two brothers. And uh, they, Minor Detail, got a, a recording deal from the US. They were the first Irish act ever to be signed directly by an American record company and I was producing you too in the studio at the time and I just did some demos for this band Minor Detail and one day in the studio I got a phone call and uh, and it was uh, you know I was just doing two tracks with you two and um, and I got a phone call and it was a high bill it's a call from an, uh, CBS Records in New York and I said oh yeah it must be for Bono or somebody and they said no no it's definitely they want to talk to you I said, okay, so I took the call and uh, this, this voice said, hi, Bill, this is so-and-so, so-and-so from CBS in New York. He said, uh, you, you produced a band, uh, some demos for a band called Minor Detail. And I said, yes, yeah, we did. yeah, that's right. And he said, well, we're very excited about it. And that started a whole thing where, uh, honestly, I have not before or since seen, except, of course, in the, with those nervous animals, but I, I, I haven't before or since seen such an extraordinary excitement. And people were flying back from the, over and back from New York. One guy came over in one day, we got the Concorde flight in the morning, went to, and then came, went back that day. And they came into the studio the same as if they were entering, entering the sanctuary in the kind of Vatican. It was like, oh my God, I mean, we're here with these guys. <laughs> so they did a fantastic deal. Long way to staying, we had loads of money as a result. Well, I didn't have loads of money, but there was a budget and a real budget. And they did a really good deal and they got a lot of money. And we bought a Fairlight. <laughs> you bought one? We bought a fair. Oh, nothing. No, none of this hiring stuff or nonsense. <laughs> we bought a Fairlight and the Fairlight was shipped in from Australia. Really? Never forget. And it arrived in the studio. And I have to say that what the Fairlight did, now, my memory is that it was like around about £180,000 for the Fairlight. It was unbelievable. And it came in the studio, this thing, and, you know, all the um, wrapping came up and we're there and we're looking into this extraordinary thing. Plug it in. Long and short of it is that um, it... I could do now on my Mac here, my, my, you know, now I could do much more than I was able to do and twice as fast, <laughs> 10 times as fast as I, we were able to do on the Fairlight at that stage. And even though a lot of people used it, like Kate Bush used it, I think that's maybe where, where I'd heard of it first. Mm. Um, because Kate had used it quite a bit and effectively. But, you know, that was uh, Philip Begley and I with the Fairlight and... We had, we had this programmer who, who spent the whole time, you know, we were sampling drums and sampling things into the, you know, there was a lot of activity that went around the recording uh, business at that stage that I don't think we suffered from in those nervous animals. Right. Because all, always the song seemed to be driving us forward with those nervous animals. It was always, what was the song about and the lyrics and the shape of the song and the arrangement? That was always kind of what it was about. But elsewhere, there was a lot of kind of dealing with, you know, finding ways of, you know, I remember when the Lindrum arrived. It was you know, excitement. Yeah, excitement about something that could play drums. I mean, kids now have it for, <laughs> you buy it for your son for Christmas and for like 20 euro. And I mean, we, we spent so much money. And honestly, if there was anything uh, in my career that, I, you know, people say, well, if you if you had time over again, what would you do? Well, the first thing I do would I would I would try to regain the time I spent, you know, looking for the perfect bass drum sound. Or so. <laughs> when when when, <laughs> when really we should have been looking for the perfect song, 
uh, and where was the emotion of the song and what was it what was it doing to your consciousness to how you regard it every day um, and how you live your life that, you know we should have been working in that area and I suppose that's one of the things about music education that that you you need to keep a focus on the actual the material what it is mm, what it very is good Bill. that's fantastic like yeah. Uh, one yeah. of the things, uh, the conversation with David Lasser was a bit about this as well, um, uh, because he talked about what was with our ears uh, in this period where digital came in and it sounded horrible, but why did we not notice that it sounded horrible? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it's a great question. <laughs> it is, and, and look at what's happened. You know, when a new technological thing happens, we, we, we tend to be starry-eyed and in love. Do you know? We are. I mean, the stuff comes in. I remember, I remember when, you know, the, the, I was first able to, to, you know, sample something and, and then have it played back. You know, and gradually the place started emptying out of musicians that were being replaced by things that, you plugged in and then you were able to buy libraries of you know Steve Gadd you didn't have to book Steve Gadd anymore you had him there's his Tom Toms you know at the end of the day all of that we fall in love with it uh, and it's like the internet in our current life in our current political social uh, and in, in our daily lives how we use something that we have fallen in love with because mm. it is it's extraordinary we're living in extraordinary times technologically but what the human is very slow to do is how to, how to, okay, fine. Okay, we understand what it does. Now, what has that got to do with actually improving the texture of our lives? Mm. You know, has that, is it improving that in any way? And, you, and to be able to stand back there is almost impossible. You know, to be able to stand back and not get into, the, I mean, I did it myself. Um, you know, all of us did it. We, everyone around me, we were all in love with the thing. And we were, you know, and digital, yes, digital gave us all kinds of possibilities and stuff. But gradually, like the internet, we have to develop a system of how to deal with it and live with it in a way that it doesn't damage us, that we're not throwing babies out with the bathwaters uh, all over the place, which we can do, you know. And one of them is what we just referred to earlier in this conversation, which was the whole joy of musicians sitting together and playing together what that does you know we had a lot of fun i remember going to gigs you did you you had a band um i remember but i remember even some of the the tunes you used to do uh, 50 ways to leave your lover was one one a right. big one um was greg right. boland in that and there would have been desi reynolds would have been uh, uh yeah uh, well I, I, there were a number of bands one was uh, the original band that i was in was a band called stack which was oh, yes. des more uh, des desi reynolds John Drummond and myself, we were a four piece and we swelled to a, a six piece with two great singers, uh, Katrina Walsh and Nicola Kerr. And that was, um, you know, we were, we were doing original material. All right. As in pubs and original material. And we were doing 50 ways to leave your lover. And we were doing, you know, the, the, the stuff that we admired, Steely Dan, of course. Yes. And then, um, uh, Greg Boland and uh, Paul McAteer, uh, Dave Murphy, uh, Tom Moore, and myself had a band uh, called Bumper to Bumper, uh, which uh, used to do Steely Dan material. And, right. you know, it was a kind of a Musos band. We loved it. <laughs> you know, uh, it was great when you could actually fill a pub with people and still be playing music and have Ooh. people you know, paying attention to the, to the, the music, you know, it's, uh, um, yeah. So you heard, you went to hear these bands, did you? God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to hear, I, 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 I'm sure, I think it was, St it would have been Stack I saw then, obviously. Stack, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Desi Reynolds now lives, lives in Sligo for some of the time. Yeah, he does, yeah. Tom, Tom Drummond is living in Mohill in County Leitrim. All oh, right. Yeah, and Desmore is still a faithful Dubliner. He'll, he'll always be there. Good. Uh, yeah. yeah, but that was it. I loved band, uh, being in the, the band Stack and 
we we played we used to play a regular gig in the Marion Inn and another one out in the Lawrence Hotel in, and we had a regular following you know we had a couple of hundred people oh yeah you know, yeah, yeah was, you know it wasn't stadium stuff but it was good <laughs> it's fantastic yeah and I, I remember one uh, some of the memories that come back to me like I remember you coming to Sligo I think when we hooked up first you had an office maybe it was in the North Circular Road or somewhere. Um, no. But you, you had an office somewhere and you had a secretary and we were very impressed. We, I remember calling you somehow, getting your number and going to it meet you. It was Waterloo Road. Waterloo, oh, Waterloo, Road. Waterloo Road, was it? I shared an office with Sean Davey. Ah, right. Right, yeah. great. And our, our, the person who looked after us was Donald Lunny's wife, his first wife, uh, Judy Lunny. She's American. All right. And, uh, and uh, yeah. That was, and that and was the, you came you came to Sligo then, and I think it was Brian Tahani's studio or somewhere. Um, and we did some demos. We did the, just what the sucker wanted. Almost kind of got written there, or you know, it, it existed, but it got developed there. Um, and then, of course, then there was the big excitement of getting into Windmill Lane and to do the more uh, posh uh, uh, places. Yes. But you know what I remember about that time because I think. I'm, you know, it's important for us to contextualize what was yes. going on. You know, I think, um, do you remember when when you used to do a gig in the Baggett Inn? Yeah. Uh, and um, what was the guy's name in the Baggett? There? Charlie. Charlie, yeah, Charlie. Um, but there was a kind of, um, there was an excitement. Now, we're, we're not, it's not the same time as the minor detail. Uh, but it was later, I think, wasn't it? Was. It, right? it was. It was 85. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I honestly, in like, I remember when I was 19 or 20 going to London and, and bringing demos of my songs and, and arranging, you know, meetings with music publishers, Dick James and, you know, all the great music publishers. <clears throat> And uh, it was the most dispiriting, <laughs> it was the most dispiriting activity ever. You know, you go in and, and, the, and there was one guy, I can't remember which company he was in, but he had this guy called Richard who used to, you know, we bring in the tape on, on reel to reel and uh, put the tape in and Richard would play this uh, song and your man would sort of sit back in his desk and he'd say, you yeah, uh, spool on the tape, Richard. Richard would spool on to the next song and we get into the intro on the first four bars and I say, spool on the time, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, it was, I remember one guy I went to see, I can't remember what the publishing company was, but his name was, I remember him because his name was Tony Lupton. And uh, Tone, Tony Lupton, I'd arranged a meeting with him, I had a letter to say that I had a, you know, a meeting with Tony Lupton and um, so I went into the offices and I, I said, hi, I'm Bill Whelan and I'm here to meet uh, Tony Lupton. And he, Hold on, please. Hello. Hello, Tony. Yes, there's a Bill Whelan here to see you. I, I don't I have no idea. Yeah. How, does he, how did you get this? I said, he wrote me a letter. Look, it's, apparently you wrote him a letter, Tony. Right. Okay. Well, I'll ask him to wait. Uh, yeah, Tony's in a meeting at the moment. You know, can you? So you're sitting there. Of course, you're in London. You think, okay, I must be somewhere near the, the centre of the heart throb here of music. So you know, I'm bound something good's kind of going to happen. And eventually, Tony looked and breezed into the reception area. He said, "Hello, I'm Tone." I said, "Hello, Tone." <laughs> he said, "He said, how did you get to meet me?" And I said, "I wrote to you." in brackets, you stupid man. And he said, um, okay, come on then, what have you got? I said, well, I have a reel to read. Oh, Jesus, you've got a reel to read, oh God. So he's in his office and he rings this guy and he says, hello, Mike, it's Tone. Yeah, remember I lent you my reel to reel machine and it came back all broken. <laughs> Can I have yours for half an hour? So, you know, you put the tapes on and, and you come out of there, you're defeated. You're, you know, you know, you, you get back on the plane and it's like, oh, maybe, maybe not, maybe not. But in, 
and and it was like such a deal that was like i was i was 19 or 20 or my early 20s maybe and the difference between that and 1985 and when I, when when those nervous animals were playing in the Bagot Inn, I remember there was one night alone when I think there were six A&R people from uh, uh, English record companies coming to hear the band. I mean, the excitement was enormous. Right. And the contrast between then and, you know, before, like a, a band or an act or songwriter or whatever out of Ireland, it was like, ah, you know, it's nonsense. And then there was U2. Oh, and, oh. And, and then once U2 happened, you could see that you could, you could vir virtually touch the kind of, ah, the avarice <laughs> that was appearing oh. uh, here. Now was a chance to find the next U2 and come to Ireland. And they were all coming in. They were like, with no problem. You kind of had to fight them off. You know, it was kind of, well, no, we can't, you know, can't see you on Thursday. You know? And uh, I, I don't know if you remember the lawyer we had, Nick, Nicholas Pedgrift. Do I do. Yeah, I do. Yes. He was so sort of English public school. <laughs> I remember one of the first things he ever said to me was, you know, Bill, I managed a band called um, uh, Gay Bikers on Acid. <laughs> what? Anyway, you know, English public school. But anyway, the, the, the whole business was suddenly Ireland centric. Guys were coming on planes every day to hear bands. And uh, that was the atmosphere Ooh. when and we played those gigs in the, in the Baggett Inn. And we'd had, we'd had my friend John as a single. And then, if you remember, we, we had the reverse thrust then when we started going to London. That me like the the big thing that seemed to me to be the real hope that we had was was Muff Winwood, right at CBS. Yes, I remember that meeting with him. Yes, yeah, and uh, so sort of, out of all of those record companies and A and R men and shysters of various sorts that appeared, um, you know the <laughs> the one that really you know I thought. Because Stevie Winwood is uh, Muff Winwood's brother. Muff Winwood was head of A&R at, um, at CBS. And, and I had done, at that stage, I had produced and arranged uh, What's Another Year for Johnny Logan. And that was that was number one record for them. So I had a good intro there. but I, I And I also felt sort of sl slightly like this could be it. And then we went to London and we met with them. And... Um, if I remember, like we came out of there, I remember us going to a restaurant near... Ooh, an, an, an Indian. An Indian, yes, exactly. We went to an Indian and we talked about it and, you know, how we thought the meeting went and blah, blah, blah. And... But he came uh, with us. He was with us in the, in the restaurant. He did. He did. That's right. That's right. God, yeah. I think we all felt it was, it was going to happen, didn't mm, we? Mm, mm. Yeah. And then, and then it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, and it's been so amazing to have that interval of what is it, you know, 35 years now, something like yeah. that. And, you know, we're here and, you know, you've had that incredible career since and a whole adventure. I've had my own adventures. Um, sure. And it's fun to to be still around, to be still enjoying music. And you're still, I mean, the 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 the, the, the animals, the nervous animals, still. It still feels alive to me as a concept, as a, as 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 a uniting flag over a particular kind of creativity. You know, it's it, it, it's great. Or uh, recently, we've been involved as well with the Bedlam Suitcase Project, or I have. You know, yeah. um, and that's been fantastic. And um, Tara is an, an incredible talent as well. Um, but you know, it, it's, how, it's is, how is she? Yeah, she's she's good. She's good yeah. for him. And um, uh, and we're planning to do more as well. We've been all sort of uh, making various. She's finishing her PhD now at the moment, so. That'll be so. We 
it was an opportunity, I suppose, over lockdown and this weird, strange time that we're in now. Um, to sort of, I sort of think, sat down and then said, well, what are the animals doing? And, and that's how we got back to it. So we recorded, um, we were, I think we in, in, eventually ended up recording five tunes, um, some rewrites, and then some other ones that we'd never really recorded properly before. Um, and so it's been fun. And who knows what will happen now, but, but it, 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 I've had a great pleasure in talking to the likes of yourself, Bill, and reconnecting, really, in a way that we, you know, over the years, and, and even like Philip Bakley as well, I've spoke recently to, um, lots of people from the past. Uh, Jerry Leonard was involved, and uh, Nicky Ryan. I spoke to him last week, and so um, it's been a terrific experience uh, uh, doing this. You know. Yeah, yeah, um, I'm sure. And and uh, same here. Like it's, uh, you know, we're at a time in lockdown, as as, as we know, is it is does offer. I mean, you can see it as a terrible imposition on our lives, but you can also see it as a an opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. An opportunity, not alone for maybe doing something you had thought about doing some time ago, other than making sourdough bread, something else, you know, something that's of interest. Mm -hmm. um, to um, and then it's, it also uh, is giving us an opportunity for reflection, to think back on what has happened across mm -hmm. periods of our lifetime and see how. You know, like it's this is a pause. It's a very a pause is very good. You know, and there's no planes in the sky. You look up and uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's, well, listen, Bill. I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this to a, a, a close. I, I wanted to thank you so much for doing this. Um, uh, yeah. And good luck with the rest of your adventures. We no doubt we'll be talking to you some more. Who knows what can come around in the future? We now that we've sort of starts to, to communicate with the, the, with the further west coast. Um, and uh, yeah, brilliant. Absolutely. And, and, you know, good luck to everybody there. And my love to everyone in, in uh, the band. And, uh, you know, I, I have such fond memories of that time. Uh, you know, and uh, such, like it really was, uh, and I've often spoken about those nervous animals, um, and I, I don't mean this in any way patronizing, but it's, 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 I look back on it for all of us that were involved in that period of those nervous animals as a time when there was like a real, we, we, we got to look at what was possible. And I often regret the fact that we didn't, and whatever part I played in it, you know, we didn't have an opportunity to push this over the line in a way, you know, we got, we were, we were scrummed down on the five yards. From the, <laughs> some, some, um, and then the ball popped out of the scrum. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, but it was, it was, you know, and there's almost like some things you do and you, um, you say, you know, what did I learn from that? And you, and you think, well, I learned never to do that again. And uh, and then other things you do, and you think, what did I learn from that? And you think, you know, well, I learned a lot, and I would do it again if I got a chance. Do you know? That's beautiful. That's a fantastic go to end on, Bill. Thanks a million. I'm going to wait. Sure. But, uh, okay. I'm going to stop the recording process. Yeah, um, okay.
to it and send it back over the internet. 